A stunning break in a cold case murder mystery from almost four decades ago. Karen Stitt was 15 years old when she was kidnapped from a bus stop in Palo Alto, raped and brutally murdered in September of 1982. On August 9th, 1982, around 10.45 a.m., a truck driver discovered a female nude body lying in the bushes at the base of a cinder block wall along the driveway of the Woolworth Garden Center where he was making a delivery. The female's wrists were bound behind her back with her shirt, her jacket was tied around her left ankle, and a blood stain was found on top of the cinder block wall just above her body. A medical examiner found that she had been stabbed 59 times in her neck, chest, abdomen, and back. Her cause of death was stab wounds to the chest and neck. The police identified the body as Karen Stitt. So who was Karen Stitt? Who murdered and raped her? Was this a murder of passion or revenge? Or a possible serial killer on the run? Welcome back to Mysterious Hook, where we shed light on under-the-radar cases across the country. My name is Matt, and today we are looking at the murder of Karen Stitt. So without any further ado, let's dive into this mystery. Sunnyvale is a city located in Santa Clara Valley in northwest Santa Clara County, California. Sunnyvale lies along the historic El Camino Reel and Highway 101 and is bordered by portions of San Jose to the north, Moffett Federal Airfield and NASA Ames Research Center to the northwest, Mountain View to the northwest, Los Altos to the southwest, Cupertino to the south, and Santa Clara to the east. As of the 2020 United States Census, Sunnyvale's population was 155,805, making it the second most populous city in the county after San Jose and the seventh most populous city in the San Francisco Bay Area. Sunnyvale is one of the few U.S. cities to have a single unified Department of Public Safety, where all personnel are trained as firefighters, police officers, and EMTs so that they can respond to an emergency in any of those three roles. Karen Stitt was born on July 25, 1967, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to Robert Stitt and Catherine Leshecki. Karen Stitt was the new girl at Palo Alto High School, as she had recently moved from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Despite her newness to the town, Karen felt comfortable using the El Camino Real bus routes, to get to and from her boyfriend's home in Sunnyvale, like if she was a native. On September 2nd, 1982, Karen and her boyfriend were hanging out late, playing some video games at a local 7-Eleven. Around midnight, they wandered over toward Golfland, a popular putt-putt course, and finally, around 12.30 a.m., Karen's boyfriend left her near a bus stop at the corner of El Camino Real and South Wolf Road. She intended to take the 22 bus back to her father's house in Palo Alto. It was there, about 100 yards away from the bus stop, along a busy stretch of roadway, cluttered with bars and restaurants, that Karen's body was discovered the next morning. Investigators noted that leaves and dirt around her feet were disturbed and kicked, suggesting that she was still alive when her body was moved there. Her boyfriend later stated that he felt bad for leaving her, but he was afraid he would be in trouble for returning home late. Although the police department gathered all the genetic evidence that was present on the site of the murder, investigators were unable to identify a suspect, and the case went cold for over 40 years. Stitt's boyfriend at the time was considered a suspect, but was eventually cleared by forensic DNA analysis in the early 2000s. By 2000, DNA analysis technology allowed investigators to build a genetic profile of the suspect from a sample taken of the blood stain on the cinder block wall above Karen's body. Swabs taken from the scene, as well as items collected from the body, were also sent to the Santa Clara County Crime Laboratory. Investigators found that an unknown male's DNA taken from the sample on the wall matched the profile for DNA found on Stitt's jacket and from sperm cells found on vaginal slides taken during her autopsy. A DNA sample from Stitt's boyfriend at the time did not match, and he was excluded as a suspect. No matches were found after comparing the unknown profile to a national DNA crime database. Detective Hutchison said that in 2021, he received a tip that a male member of the Ramirez family may have killed Stitt launching his genealogical search. The tipster is still being kept anonymous by the police. 
However, U.S. Census records and other public databases show that the Ramirez family lived in Fresno, about 160 miles from Sunnyvale, as early as 1950, according to the detective's statement. Hutchison found that there were four living Ramirez brothers. Further investigation ruled out two of the brothers, and the third brother was later conclusively ruled out by DNA. This left only Gary Ramirez to focus on. In early March, Hutchison was able to identify Ramirez's daughter, and he obtained a sample of her DNA on April 8th. Court documents did not say how the detective got the sample. Investigators found a very strong statistical support tying DNA from Ramirez's daughter to the unknown male DNA from the crime scene, the detective said, establishing Ramirez as the prime suspect. The 75-year-old man, accused of murdering the Palo Alto teenager 40 years ago, abducting her from a Sunnyvale bus stop, then raping her and stabbing her 59 times before dumping her body nearby, is Gary Jean Ramirez. Tracked from blood splotches at the crime scene through DNA and family tree genealogy, Ramirez had no previous criminal record when he was arrested on August 2nd, living in a guest house on the Hawaiian island of Maui, police say. Ramirez's 79-year-old brother, Rudy Ramirez, told this news organization that he was shocked when his brother was arrested and told authorities, you've got the wrong man. According to Rudy, Ramirez had joined the Air Force as a young man and lived in Colorado, Utah, and San Diego. He also spent time in San Francisco and other parts of California, including Fresno, where he was raised, authorities say. He had married twice and worked odd jobs, including as an exterminator before retiring on disability with a bad hip some years ago. Rudy said he lost track of his younger brother in the 1980s, around the time of Karen's murder. In the late 1980s, he said his brother was living temporarily with their mother in Fresno. Rudy invited him then to move to Maui. Growing up in Fresno, Gary was the favorite child and had no history of violence, Rudy said. He was a kid that had everything going. He just had the old Midas touch. In later years, he said Gary became reclusive. Although authorities say the DNA evidence is overwhelming against Ramirez, they are continuing to corroborate elements of the case and are urging witnesses who may have known Ramirez through the decades to come forward with additional information. The sudden but long-awaited break in Karen's decades-old murder brought surprise and relief to her friends and family. But Ramirez's arrest also has opened old wounds, long locked away. Karen hadn't lived in Palo Alto for very long before her death. A Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania transplant, she had moved to the Bay Area just a few months before with her brother and father. Still, her classmates remembered her fondly. Karen was not like any other girl I had met before. When she transferred from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to Palo Alto, California to live with her father during the second half of my sophomore year in high school, the first time I set eyes on her, I knew she was special. Someone I wanted to get to know, Michael Calhoun, a former boyfriend, said in an August 10th email. Her smile could light up the darkest of rooms, her beautiful feathered blonde hair and the way she spoke. I won't say it was an accent per se, but it was different than any other girl I knew. Calhoun was not the boyfriend who police said Karen walked toward the bus stop that night that she died. Calhoun said he lived around the corner from her in Palo Alto. She had been dating one of his best friends, so he initially stayed clear of dating her, he recalled, but he was smitten. It was kind of like that Rick Springfield song, Jesse's Girl, except I was singing, I want Jimmy's girl. When they broke up, I did the cardinal sin amongst friends, I started dating her myself. But I did ask my friend first if it was okay. He didn't have a problem with it. I really fell hard for her. I'd say she was my first true love, he said. Karen and Calhoun took a break from their relationship during the summer, but she did want to explore getting back together once they returned to school. As a token of this, she let me keep a ring of hers she gave me when we were together. A copper ring with her name on it, which I still have to this day, he said. Getting back together never happened, however. She was violently stolen from everyone. My first day back to school as a junior was the day of her funeral, he said. Calhoun never gave up hope that Karen's killer would be identified and captured. It was because of losing her that I became interested in becoming a police officer. Not that I thought I could actually help in her case, but to be able to help someone else, Calhoun said. 
I even stayed in contact with the cold case detective in Sunnyvale after I moved to Las Vegas. He told me he was fairly new on the force when this happened. He even told me he was on the scene that fateful night, so he was very familiar with the case. With the advancement of technology in the field of genealogy, the police are now solving cold cases that remained unsolved, while providing justice to the families of the victims, but also punishing criminals that are a threat to the society. This is a prime example of how technology has helped crack one of the most mysterious cold cases. So let us know your thoughts in the comment section, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more in-depth coverage of some of the most compelling cases.